You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM 640. Earlier in the show, we had this discussion where we start with one thing and it leads to another thing and it leads to another thing. We're talking about haircuts and how this new haircut is sweeping the nation thanks to social media and teenage boys, for the most part, are the ones who are wearing it called the alpaca. And it got us talking about other hairstyles that we've worn or had over the many years and decades. We went around the studio and then we started talking about the Gumby haircut, which led us to the Gumby show. And then there was a question of whether anyone under a certain age would have even known anything about the Gumby show, Pokey, any of that. We delved into Davy and Goliath, played the theme music to that. And it reminded me that in the studio, we have producer Lindsay, who's one third my age. And I wasn't sure whether any of this made any sense. She said that she had seen after we showed her a scene of Dave and Goliath, she had recognized it. But as far as Gumby, you said you had seen Gumby because an older relative. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my older cousin, he's 12 years older than me. Um, and my grandma had a whole bunch of like VSA, uh, just a whole bunch of stuff on it. And uh, yeah, I've seen it because of him because she had the archives. But you didn't watch it on your own. There was no time where you remember just seeing it on TV because I don't think it's on TV anywhere. No. I'm quite sure you could find it on streaming if you look for the episodes, but not on TV. I don't think ever live. It was like we'd pull out something and put it in and watch that. So Gumby to me was never entertaining. It was never funny. It was never special. It was just stupid to me. But most of my friends love Gumby. I don't I don't quite get it. Does anyone know what Gumby was? Pokey was like a pony, wasn't he? Some equine cl- right. clay being. <laughs> equine oh, clay okay. Being. I thought you were I was like, yeah, he's clay, but yeah, I don't know what he's actually was, was. It supposed to be humanoid? He's like a living eraser. Kinda. I would just categorize him as like an alien, just because but as a clay, you know. But yeah, you're right, because Pokey was obviously a pony and then, you know. I never got the whole point of the, the show, and I honestly don't know, so I'm asking out of ignorance. Gumby and Pokey were were buddies, friends. Was it like a guardianship relationship? What was it? It well, in the intro, it said they're friends. Okay, they're buddies, Gumby and Pokey. Yeah. Okay. All right. And you never watched Gumby's, but you said you watched Veggie Tales growing up. Oh yeah, lots of Veggie Tales. What else? What? Okay, so you graduated college in twenty twenty two, twenty twenty one. Okay. Uh, so I grew up watching like Bear in the Big Blue House. That was my favorite. Never heard of it. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm quite sure I was 30 oh, no. years past the, the you know the age group that they were shooting for. But go ahead. What else did yeah, you see? I watched that. Um, I used to watch like Dora. Dora and, the Explorer. I'm familiar with that only because my nephew would watch that every day. Yeah. Um, Bear in the Big Blue House. Uh, I'm like blanking out right now. But give me a second. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to fire some titles at you and just tell me if you've ever heard of them. Okay. The New Zoo Review. No. Coming right at you. Doesn't ring a bell. Mm-mm. Uh, Romper Room. Nope. <sighs> wow. I mean, I'm done at Romper Room. That's <laughs> um cuts deep. <laughs> uh, which one was it? New Zoo Review, Romper Room, Dusty's Treehouse. Um, I've heard of it, but I don't think I ever watched it. Oh, my goodness. Great Space Coaster. Great Space Coaster. Nope. Get on board. Doesn't ring a bell. Mm-mm. I'm just thinking about children's... Okay, real easy one. Electric Company. Yes. You've heard of it? Yes. Have you ever watched it? No. <laughs> Have you heard of Morgan Freeman? Yes. Okay, that's where you got to start. Okay. Um, Sesame Street? Oh, yes, yes. Sesame Street I used to watch. Okay. Um, okay. Right. What about The Muppet Show? Yes. I love The Muppets. Okay. There's, you're somewhat redeemable. Okay. Somewhat. How, Thank you. How, do you, how do you not? Oh, my goodness. Get nope. into the uh, Sid and Marty Croft stuff. Oh, that was coming up next. Yeah, yeah. Um, Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. I know who they are, but I don't think I ever watched it. Dr. Shrinker. No. Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. No. Everybody needs friends. Sigmund the Sea Monster. <laughs> it's like nothing. her eyes are glazing over. <laughs> it's just nothing. Um. Uh, uh, Land, Land of the, of the Lost. Lost. Mm, I think so, yeah. Oh, 
this no, either is, you do or you don't. This, this is, is crushing to my soul. Yeah. Wow. I don't think she's going to know Lidsville. Lidsville? Not. Wow. You went deep with Lidsville. <laughs> I just want to point a reference to see if we're living on the same planet at the same time in history, if we share anything in common. Um, but when we say Sid and Marty Croft, does that ring a bell? No. No reference point. Nothing. Mm -mm. Okay, you know that Will Ferrell did a movie called Land of the Lost, right? No? No. <laughs> if I said Tommy and Annika, do you know who they are? Nope. Pippi? I don't think so. Long? <laughs> Stucky? <laughs> I've heard of that. I, I I was watching shows in like the early 2000s. Benny Hill. Wait, in the early 2000s? Mm -mm. Never heard of Benny Hill. Oh, mm -mm. come on. Everybody knows Benny Hill. I don't know. Dun, 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 they don't make t-shirts. Like, like oh, cool okay, yeah. Of, Familiar uh, with that, too. Okay, then let's get the theme to Benny Hill. Yakety yeah, sax. Don't talk back. Did you ever see the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? I think so, yeah. I don't remember it, but like I remember watching it. Do you know what it's about? Does it, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. I know. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I don't remember Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. We I remember the you. songs, though, yeah. Okay, it's about this flying car. And Benny Hill was a co-star. People don't remember that, but he was in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That is Benny Hill's secret connection to James Bond. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now that I didn't know. Yeah. yeah because Ian Fleming wrote Ian Chitty Fleming. Chitty Bang mm -hmm. Bang Bang. Yes, he has a small part in Chitty Chitty. Um, uh, Willy Wonka. That I know. Okay. Uh, Herbie the Love Bug? The car, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure. I think this game ends with us taking morphine, doesn't it? <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> Someone is not getting out of here alive. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Go home, producer Lindsay. You've made all of us feel very bad about ourselves. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> and you were born in what year? 1999. KFI AM 640, we're live everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app, and this kind of flew under the radar. We talked last night about janet jackson what she said about kamala harris in an interview and i said i'm all for celebrities using or not using their celebrity their platform their voice however they see fit i recommend that they at least be informed because when you are a celebrity you have a sphere of influence which is larger than the average person and so if you say something which is factually untrue or full of disinformation or misinformation it has a an outsized impact on people who may listen to you or look up to you but if you're going to use your platform or not that's up to you you earned your celebrity it's yours to use it as you see fit but more and more people especially in this political climate are using their celebrity to make statements you can agree or disagree i'm just making the observation that more and more are doing it the latest is um, Tim McGraw, country singer, and he went to Instagram over the weekend, and it was weird to me because he made a political statement as part of saying happy birthday to his wife. That's the, the odd thing. It's like usually if you're going to make your statement, you're going to make your statement. If you're going to say happy birthday, then say happy birthday. But he put them together. And on Instagram on Saturday, the 21st, Tim McGraw said the following, quote, Happy birthday to this remarkable woman, my beautiful, strong, crazy, badass wife. I love my girl with everything that I am and could ever hope to be. She is our beacon, our rock, our strength. The girls and I are so very blessed. Talking about wife Faith Hill, who's famous in her own right. But if you kept reading the, the birthday greeting, it turns quasi-political, which I found very interesting. Quote, our girls could not have had, could not have a better role model in their lives as how to be an incredibly strong woman and how to believe in themselves and be in charge of their lives. Parentheses, every aspect of their lives. Let's honor the women in our lives with respect and make sure that we fight for their rights right alongside them. Now, in 
a vacuum, you think like, well, what is he making reference to? Well, in today's uh, particular political uh, climate, it's obviously talking about reproductive rights and women's rights and how that's going to be a big issue for people who may be going to the polls talking about that. Now, Tim McGraw, again, can do whatever he wants. I just find it strange that if I were going to say, you know, Mark, happy birthday. I appreciate you as a brother. I appreciate you as a friend. I think that you are a great man. That's one thing. But the moment I turn the corner and say, and by the way, I want you to remember how much it is important to me that um, I want you to make America great again this next year you have in life. It just doesn't seem like it goes together. Uh, no, but keep it coming, though. I like this. <laughs> I, I don't feel like you show your appreciation nearly uh, enough. Uh, and uh, these words are music to my, uh, well, ears, I guess. Well, we ought to know that it's a hypothetical, and I would never say anything like that in life. Yeah, everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> my thing is, like, if you, look, I feel as if, and I'm really parsing here, I admit that. I feel as if you're going to say happy birthday to your wife, then damn it, say happy birthday to your wife. If you want to make a statement about women's rights, then make a statement about women's rights. And to kind of fold it in there and hide it as if you really don't want to step too far out there. You just want to put your toe in the pool and almost put it in code. And for people who are really paying attention to realize, oh, you're talking about women's reproductive rights. Okay, you feel strongly about that. But what does that have to do with happy birthday, babe? What does that have to do with happy birthday, Faith Hill? It just seems like it, it's just gratuitous. It's just that, that, are, are we sure that that's what Faith feels? Because that's what you're saying. That's not what she's saying. Well, it's festive. It is festive. And I know, you, you know, if you're a girl dad and everything, it's just, it just seems like just separate them. Uh, you know, look, if, if, look, I have a birthday coming up in November. And when you say happy birthday to me, Mark, and you will. When you say happy birthday to me, I would hope that you wouldn't use that opportunity in celebrating Morrismas. That's what it is? Yes, it's called Morrismas Day. Is it like Willis Ween on Coast to Coast? Yeah, yes, it's very <laughs> similar in nature. Yes, go with that. Okay. If you're going to acknowledge Morrismas Day, then I would hope that you would not also fold in your political ideology, whether I agree with it or not. I would just want a simple birthday greeting. I don't want all the other stuff. You know, like, happy birthday, Morrismas. Happy Morrismas Day. You know, go Kamala. So what? Why would you do that? Why happy you do that? Morrismas Day, you fascist. <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> can we just keep the birthday greeting over here and the commentary over there. I hope you don't think you're getting a present for Morris Mistake because <laughs> I'm not a dirty socialist like right. that. Is that right. what you mean? Right, exactly, because it seems like the political commentary is about you, Tim McGraw, getting back to the story. Even though the birthday greeting may be about you as in your wife, Faith Hill, it just seemed really odd, self-serving, out of place, and damn right rude. It's like... Just wish your wife happy birthday. And then if you want to make a separate statement about what you feel about women's rights, I'll do it. But, but it just seems like you're undercutting your own wife's birthday greeting to make an unrelated point. And it's not about whether people agree with you. I'm just thinking like, damn, dude, if I were your wife, like, I would be kind of pissed off at that. Can I just get a birthday greeting? It's almost like handing me a birthday gift. And oh, by the way. You know, and in the card it says, you know, MAGA. It's like, don't do that. Don't do that. I just think it's, it's kind of disrespectful to Faith Hill. It wasn't like Faith Hill had come out and, and said this. That's all I'm saying. Well, the important thing is that now that I know when your birthday is, I can start saving up for something. Well, I didn't say when my birthday is. I just said it's coming up. In November, I thought you said. Yeah, but the, look, the, the 30 days in November, okay? <laughs> you got a one in 30 chance. Oh, so there can be the 30 days of Morrismas. That's right. That's right. Not to be confused with the 12 days of Mo when I was working on the weekends and then I'd have to fill in for everybody. There was a time where I worked like 16 out of 17 days on air. Oh, I think most of us here have done some permutation of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it really, really tests whether you love radio. I mean, whether you love radio. The hardest part was when I was working New Year's Eve one year and I was in for Tim Conway Jr. from 6 to 10 p.m. New Year's Eve. 
And then I was in for Gary and Shannon at 10 a.m. the next day. Yeah, those short, short turnarounds are good. And this, this whole thing that you're talking about now is the radio version of your dad catching you smoking and making you smoke the whole pack right in front of him. <laughs> right. You like oh, radio? Like, oh, you want to smoke? You're oh, going yeah. you're, you're to do some radio yeah. good and hard for two weeks straight. And Robin said, oh, so you want to be on the radio each day? Oh, so you want to be on Monday through Friday? Well, how about Monday through Wednesday of next week. Yeah, here you go. See you know, how you like he, that. Like, he, you asked for it. You, no, 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 no. You said you wanted to be on the radio each day. Well, okay, here here it is. By the way, don't drink too much New Year's Eve because you're back on at 10 a.m. And that night I just slept in my office. I got off the air. Did you really? Oh, swear. Wow. I had an air mattress I brought in. Wait, you had an office? This it was an earlier configuration oh, okay. of the building. All right, okay, yeah. before they chopped off half, half of it. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I was on for... for for in for Tim from six to ten p.m. I went to Jerry's Deli, um, Coldwater Canyon and Ventura Boulevard. Had some food there. Came back at around one thirty. Slept on an air mattress I brought from home in the office. Um, then got up, hit the hot spots in the bathroom, and did the show from ten a.m. to two p.m. And then finally went home, January first. And then came back in on January 2nd and did the normal 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. slot. I don't know. I think I hold the record for consecutive days here. But really, it's a contest nobody wins. It's nobody like, wins. It's like the Batan death march of yeah. radio. You got to ask Neil. I think he's kept records of it the most consecutive days on air. Yeah, I think I got at least like 18 days in a row once. Then you might be because I've, I've done, let's say, 18 out of 19, 18 out of 20, something like that. Because when I was doing the Mo Kelly show, which was Saturday and Sunday... I would do the five days during the week filling in for someone. Then I would do my show Saturday, Sunday. And depending on where the holidays hit as far as Christmas Day, New Year's Day, we may have a best of. I was on the air for those as well through the next weekend. Good times. Oh, yeah. Good times. You're making me wistful (laughs) for the good old days. It's later with Mo Kelly. KFI AM 640. We are live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Yes, we are all over the place tonight. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. It's Later with Mo Kelly live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And when I see stories like this, people who are going on strike in an industry I hear, I hold he, a near and dear to my heart. It pains me because I know how this story is going to end. Journalists employed by the Southern California News Group, which include Orange County Register, LA Daily, Daily News, have overwhelmingly voted to authorize a strike. This was announced yesterday. The SCNG union said it that its members granted their leadership the authority to call an open-ended walkout by a vote of 94%. And I'm with them all the way. But I don't think this will have a happy ending. More than 90% of 125 unionized journalists, and this is including reporters, photographers, digital social media production staffers, spanning 11 different newsrooms, participated in a strike authorization vote. So all of these individuals presumably will be going out on strike. And my heart is with them. The SCNG uh, union belongs to the Media Guild of the West, which also represents journalists at the LA Times. Keep that in mind. We know what has happened to the LA Times. The labor organization has accused SCNG of engaging in unfair labor practices, probably true, Stalling contract negotiations, probably true. And underpaying its employees, probably true. And they allege that many SCNG reporters haven't received a raise in more than a decade. Definitely true. All those things can be true. And I don't know that any eventual strike is going to bring about the desired result. And I point back to what happened with the LA Times and how that was gutted in recent years. And even though all of those deserving professionals um, had every right to ask for more, ask for better, deserve more and better, the print news industry, and Mark, you know better than I do, the print news industry has been struggling so very long, even if they strike and get 
a little bit of what they want, I think it ends ultimately with massive layoffs. Yeah, when you say it's been struggling, what you mean is it's been going through an ongoing extinction right. for the last 20 years, and it's a terrible, terrible time for any newspaper to go on strike. I don't know. And Look, you and I are both very sympathetic. You have worked in various newsrooms. I've worked in various newsrooms. I know what they're up against. I know what they're dealing with. I know what it means to be paid those low wages with absolutely no real chance of moving up, no real chance of better wages or or higher pay. And sometimes you believe that the only recourse you have is to go on strike. And a lot of these institutions are hanging on by a thread and, and just to let you know like um we have someone who's a commentator here i don't want to give too much to that person's business but they also work as a reporter for a, a print outlet and that print outlet is going under as we speak so i know that even though that, um, emotionally i agree with them and they are right they deserve better i don't know if better is available yeah it's kind of an impossible position because even if Nobody did anything. Newspapers would still be going extinct. Throw a strike in. Uh, I mean, right. I, we, we, we talked about this a little bit on Friday when I filled in for you and you were in for Conway. Newspaper reporters, it's a calling for them. And so they don't do it for the money because there's not that much money there. They do it because it's a worthwhile thing to do. And pardon me if I sound cheesy, but I believe it. I think it's a noble profession. You wouldn't know anything except what people with more power and money than you wanted you to know if it weren't for newspaper reporters specifically. I think it's more than noble. I think it's necessary. It, well, it's called out in the Constitution. It's here specifically to be a watchdog for democracy. And like I said, you can say that that sounds cheesy, but it's 100% true. And so, you know, when, when people who aren't making a ton to begin with are squeezed so hard that they feel like they have to go on strike, honestly, nobody wins. If you think about the history of print media, the recent history of print media in Southern California, there are any number of papers which have gone under from the Herald Examiner on down. This is only moving and has only been moving in one direction. Um, Long Beach Post just getting ready to go under. You know, they're not making more print outlets. There are fewer. There are fewer jobs and there isn't more money to be had. And although intellectually... And emotionally and professionally, I agree with everything that they're asking for in the strike. Not only are they not going to get it, I'm not so sure many of these outlets are going to survive. We saw the bloodbath at the L.A. Times in the past year of all the people that were laid off from their podcasting and the editorial departments. Yeah, uh, newspaper strikes are miserable. I've been through one, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. They're they're really agonizing as well um, because... I think what maybe people on the outside don't understand is that people who have been at a given newspaper for a long time, they do bring old grievances into the issue and management or ownership, whichever it is, uh, they don't always act in, in good faith. Add to that, uh, I, don't, I don't know, um, you know specific instances of this, but there, there are many, many examples of venture capitalists buying up a newspaper, bleeding it dry, and then the people who are left behind have to deal with that as well. Yeah, yeah, and... Um Look, L.A. Times had to go through a lot of fundraising uh, difficulties. They were hanging on by a thread before they let all those people go. And the reason I highlighted L.A. Times in this story is because it's not going to be any different. And I hope that I'm wrong. I really do hope that I'm wrong. But I don't think it's going to be any different from what happened at the L.A. Times when we talk about the Southern California News Group Union belongs to the Media Guild of the West, which also represents journalists at the L.A. Times, we saw what happened at the L.A. Times. So why should this be any different? It's later with Mo Kelly. We'll catch up with George Norrie in just a moment. KFI AM 640 live everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. And George Norrie, we're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app, Coast to Coast AM, with the aforementioned. Good evening, George. Good evening, Mr. Kelly. We've got a great show tonight. We've always got a great show. Yes, you do. 
this uh, first couple hours, we're going to talk about extending our lives, and then later on in the show, a little bit for you, alien abduction. Okay, two quick things. First, yeah. I don't know if I would want to live past 100, and I've talked about this before because living past 100 means I get to say goodbye to everyone I know and love, and it seems like it would be very lonely at that point in life. What say you? As long as I'm healthy and have a good lifestyle, I wouldn't mind living that long. But you are right about one thing. We do say goodbye to the ones we love. I've done that uh, over the past couple of years, and uh, it's not easy. No, no. Um, and other thing, do you know anything as of yet about Steven Spielberg's newish, when I say news, next year or so, a UFO movie, which is highly under wraps, but you may have heard something about it, what it's supposed to be about? It is deep under wraps, but I'm told it could be another dandy, so I'm looking forward to it. I would love, he says he would never do a sequel, but I would love the possibility of a sequel to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Classic. Where's Richard Dreyfuss these days? Haven't seen him much. He is low-key. He's been getting in trouble with his most recent public appearances. He's had some weird, my word, outbursts, and I've interviewed him twice, and he seems like he... <sighs> He's not the same guy anymore. Let me put it that way. Great actor. I miss the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, he's had some episodes lately publicly. Okay. Not good. But I'll be listening in. See you soon. And before we get out of here, uh, yeah, let me just follow up on that. When I was working for Tavis Smiley, we had, had booked him. Mark, and you could appreciate this. We had booked him, and I think it was for the it was for the DNC. Yes, it was in Denver, so I can remember it was Denver 2008. Because I went to both the DNC and RNC that year. And we interviewed him. And you have this pre-interview where you want to get a feel for what they want to talk about. And he talked wanted to talk about this new project he was doing. I can't remember what it was. It was some something about something. But we put that into the run of questions that um, my boss could ask him. My boss asked him and he says, where did you get that from? What are you talking about? Okay. Yeah. And, and, he, and he got to be angry. You know, classic change of personalities um uh questionable short-term memory and so when i saw the subsequent issues in the past year or so it's like yeah i've seen that up close and personal firsthand the sudden change of personality not remembering what he just said or information that he shared five minutes beforehand I've seen a lot of stories about him recently and actually accidentally mailed uh emailed another mark uh, <laughs> a feature about whatever the hell's going on with him. Uh, there's, there's a lot. And if you say he did a recent, uh, one of Bill Maher's, uh, podcast shows where he, he uh, they, right. they get loaded in his man cave <laughs> and Dreyfus is practically horizontal on a chair. It's, it's a hilarious thing. And you can find those on YouTube. They're free. Yeah. Uh, and I was watching Close Encounters of the Third Kind again, the director's cut, I want to say maybe a month and a half ago or so, because again, you watch a movie as an adult is different than seeing it as a kid. It still holds up, is still brilliant. I still wonder what that movie would, movie would look like with today's special effects capabilities. That's why I was asking George, like, if there was any possibility or anything he heard about it being the the new Steven Spielberg UFO movie might it connect in any way to Close Encounters. Anything Spielberg does is good, but you cannot overstate the impact Close Encounters had on pop culture back in, what was it, like 77? 77. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, because Jaws was 75. Uh, think of the run that guy had, too, by the way, Spielberg, back he, then. He's one of those directors. If it's, if it's something sci-fi and Steven Spielberg is doing it, I'm 100% in. I don't care if he has a thousand duds. If it's going to be sci-fi Steven Spielberg, I'm watching it. I don't care what anyone says. I thought Minority Report was vastly underappreciated. Oh, I definitely. thought his version of War of the Worlds was vastly underappreciated. Yeah. Flawed, but underappreciated. There's no way anybody could make the case that that's not a worthy movie to sit and enjoy, no matter how much you love the uh, original. I think George Powell, the one with Gene Barry, and Gene Barry uh, does a cameo in, in the Spielberg one as well, like elderly, near-death Gene Barry, but still a real emotional moment to see him there. Yeah, and using Morgan Freeman for the narration, just, mm, chef's kiss, it was perfect.
Ready Player One was fantastic too. That's another one. Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people didn't like it. They said it wasn't as good as the book. I don't give a damn. I was watching the movie. I wasn't reading the movie. Yeah, Yeah. I I went into that sight unseen and I was blown away by Ready Player One. Yes, I was so much thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Not appreciated, and that's why I think sometimes you know, and he can be a little eccentric and he can be a little obtuse with some of his views about streaming and the Oscars. But as a director, I am all the way in. And if he's coming out with something sci-fi, I am not going to miss it. Oh, absolutely not. He was out of that group of new Hollywood filmmakers of the 70s, and he was the straight arrow of the group. Well, it, while everybody else was out, well, I can't say what they were doing on the air, but you can imagine. It's so weird because we never got that real combined project between George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's Raiders what Raiders was, was, yeah. I know, but still, in in the in terms of sci-fi, because I had read that Steven Spielberg wanted to direct one of the Star Wars movies, and George said no. I would have loved to have seen Spielberg, Spielberg's treatment of a Star Wars movie. Well, he probably it, could have made that Return of the Jedi fantastic, because he already had that mentality like if you would have had more of an et vibe than an ewok vibe right. it would have been much better yeah fewer teddy bears please yes and a lot of people don't know that if you haven't seen the original return of the jedi before they started changing stuff around and taking out the ewok song it's a completely different movie i think there's no way that spielberg wouldn't have made that better is there anybody alive who wasn't disappointed by Return of the Jedi? I, I don't know. Not um, alive, no. Not alive, yeah. <laughs> okay. No, seriously. Uh, yeah, yeah, not alive. Mm-hmm. And the people who are alive, we don't have any power or pull. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter at this point. The movie is what it is. It could have been much better. It, it was a. It was an end to the storyline. It could have been much better, though, how they ended it. From the seriousness of Empire Strikes Back to the silliness of... A Return of the Jedi. Why couldn't they do something now? I, we act like Steven Spielberg is is dead or something. He could get with George Lucas and they could do the ultimate Star Wars story. Actually, they couldn't because I don't think Disney would allow George Lucas to touch any of the Star Wars uh, stuff anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that. Kathleen Kennedy? Oh, hells no. Yeah. They're yeah. not cool like that. Yeah, you're right. KFI AM640. We're live everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. If you missed it, we got it. KFI and KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live.